everybody gets to see my everyone gets to see my dirty office all right so if you see on the screen we're actually got our guy who won adrian cortez 5304 so adrian cortez 5304 you won this sick shirt and we've got two versions of this shirt um, so you're going to win this specific one, but in future giveaways, we're going to be giving out the other version of this shirt once we get that in-house. And I will say this, we've got some freaking sweet designs uh, on the back end coming your guys' way in the very near future. And if you remember, what's up Vasu, got your DM, uh, R2, how you doing? And if you guys remember... Um, what you need to do, so the way that Adrian Cortez 5304, the way he won that free t-shirt is he commented. He had all of his, uh, what is it called, all of his notifications, uh, and he subscribed to the channel. Okay, so that's the main, that's the main factor there to get that uh, free shirt, to get into that drawing. And we're going to do that on every single YouTube video. Then you got to show up to the YouTube Live and then we're going to email us. You have to email us, Adrian Cortez, 5304. You've got to email us at support at garagestrength.com. Uh, you won the giveaway. And then you've got to provide a screenshot of your YouTube studio using the same account that you used to enter the giveaway so that we can verify that you're the winner. So you just take a screenshot. You can black out uh, the, the revenue or anything like that. So you can just show us. And then you got to tell us your shirt size in American sizes. Um, and then the address that you want us to ship, us, ship that T-shirt to. So... That's how you guys are going to claim um, that free t-shirt. You've got a comment. Uh, what's up? Mifflin Football Better 24. Yo, what's up, dog? Uh, Rom Rom. Hi, Dane. I have stalled on bench press. How can I improve my bench without fancy equipment? As I'm too poor to buy. Clap push-ups. Now, I want to go into a couple key questions uh, that we went over f that we got from this past week's YouTube videos. And then I'm going to rehash who won that free shirt giveaway. Remember, this free shirt is going to be given away on every single YouTube video that we put out. And to do that, you've got to comment, you've got to put on all of your notifications, and you've got to subscribe to the channel. And then to get it, you got to show up in the YouTube Live on Tuesdays at Public Live. And then when you show up, if you win it, Adrian, take a screenshot, email us, send us your address, send us your size, and make sure that that screenshot's also in the email. Uh, Steve Wonderland, what is up? Now, let's go into Zach Hurwitz. Okay, so Zach Hurwitz, 9441, um, he asked a, a really good question where he said, in regards to programming, okay, in regards to programming, in the case of split jerks, it makes sense to me uh, in terms of overloading the triceps at the lockout without fatigue being a huge factor while priming the nervous system to be really explosive. So he's, he was talking on uh, the video we did with Sam Mattis, who's the number three discus thrower in the world currently. I think maybe he's now number four because Alex Rose, who's also a GS thrower, is the number one discus thrower in the world. Um, so he's saying it makes sense to do behind-the-neck jerks or you know split jerks or push presses to prime the nervous system for explosiveness. But let's say for movements like barbell deadlifts, okay, and any type of barbell clean, would those even go together? And if so, which would you perf perform first? So I think the question is, if you're doing a deadlift and a clean, okay, one, can you put them together, okay, and two, how would you set it up? And for me personally, um, if I was going to deadlift on a day, okay, so if I, this is a really unique question, so I, I, I really like this, this is from Zach Hurwitz, uh, 9441, so you guys, what we're going to try and do is, when you guys... Best Fitness Channel Bench has gone up 60 pounds following the, the, the GS protocol. That's freaking awesome. So a couple things that we're doing here now. We're going to take comments. We're going to take comments off of YouTube videos, okay? And even if we get some comments on Instagram, we're live on my personal Instagram, which is GhostfaceDMilla, okay? I got my sweet Aesop Rock shirt. A lot of people don't like Aesop Rock, but blast the song Daylight today. It's one of those chill hip hop, hip hop songs that I really like. Um, so we're live on Ghostface D Miller and we're live on YouTube live. And if we take these questions, if you've got good comments, we're going to take them. We're going to take three and we're going to answer them along with providing you guys a winner for those t-shirts. So he's asking if we want to deadlift 
and clean in the same workout? How would I do it? How would I set that up? I think that's a freaking sweet question. And the way I would look at it is, what's my priority in that workout, okay? Is my priority power cleans, okay? Or is my priority a heavy deadlift? And if my priority is a heavy deadlift, okay, so let's play this, let's play this game. If my priority is a heavy deadlift, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do like four doubles or five singles of power clean at like 65 to 75%. And I might only do that with like 30 to 60 seconds rest. So what I want to do is I want to go through a warm up. let's say PVC pipe walks, some, some overhead squats, stuff like that. And then, okay, after I do that nice general warm up. Then I'm going to do, I'm, I'm focusing on a big deadlift. I want a big deadlift. I might start, let's say my best clean is 300 pounds. I want to start at like 225. I'll do a double, 235, a double, 245, a single, 250, a single, 260, a single. Then I'm going to rest three to four minutes and I'm going to start deadlifting. Okay, so that's going to really wake your nervous system up. And that pulling position off the floor is going to transfer really well. So it's, it's looking at, priming the nervous system, get the sweat rolling, get the nervous system stimulated, get your brain focused on everything, then get into the heavy deadlifts. Now, there's a couple interesting factors here. You could look at it, and I would play this game, okay? And this is stuff that we do do with our weightlifters. If I want a big power clean, there's two factors. Do you have a nervous system that responds well to being fully rested? If you do, then you should do power cleans first. Okay, or do you have a nervous system that responds really well to potentiation? If you respond really well to potentiation, then you could do deadlifts first, but I would recommend doing a clean grip deadlift with posture that is more upright, not with that rounded upper back. Okay, we've talked about technique and the deadlift and how that rounded upper back can actually optimize uh, your pull. So what I would recommend is if you respond to potentiation, and it also depends on where you're at in your programming. In our programming, if we're inside of comprehension phase or we're inside the ascension phase, we're going to use potentiation. Okay, so I would actually do those clean grip pulls, those clean grip deadlift first. And then I would rest two to four minutes and then I would do my power clean. So we could do like four doubles at 60 to 80% on, on deadlifts. Okay, so we could work up to, let's say my best deadlift is 600 pounds. I could work up to 440, 480, 500 pounds. And I just do a single to a triple, somewhere in there, not overly fatigued, but enough to really wake me up. I rest two to four minutes, and then I start my power cleans. So then when I start, start my power cleans, I'm going to feel really, really, really amped up, and that's going to help me hit a bigger power clean. Okay, and if you don't respond to potentiation, well, then you can just do power cleans first, and you just slowly build into that. So that's a good question from Zach Hurwitz uh, from our, our video with Sam, uh, where we talked about that explosive upper body. That's a great question. Who can guess what's in my cup? Carpet Gym Ollie Lifting 8078. Man, I love these I love these questions and these uh, these uh, handles. Carpet Gym Ollie Lifting 8078. 8078 is a great throw in the hammer throw. When I see numbers, I think about sports and what they could mean for sports. So, could you try and do a video for getting big for really tall lifters? I'm trying to become a fridge. Oh man, I was just watching uh, 40, I was just studying, who was it, Jordan Davis and the other big D lineman or offensive lineman out of Georgia who ran uh, like a 4.83 in the 40, um, just a big hoss. Uh, so this guy, Carpet Jim, Carpet Jim Oli Lifter is asking, I want to become a fridge, he's really tall, he's 6'4", uh, what can you do? So what I would start with is... Try to increase your volume in squats, okay? And, and it depends on your limb length with your legs, and being tall can be uh, a struggle. Uh, Vasu just commented, start with raw milk. Yes, I would start with raw milk. So carpet gym only lifter, um, that's another big factor. What are you eating, right? Okay, so if we're eating uh, in a caloric surplus, it's going to be easier to gain weight. Econ, thank you, boom, for that super chat. If you guys are watching on Instagram, you can head over to the YouTube Live and I can actually see your comments. Um, it's the first time we've done like the dual Instagram Live with YouTube Live, so it's it's interesting. We're not watching those comments, but stay tuned because I'm going to offer some really cool stuff and you guys can learn how to how to win those free shirts and get your, 
your comments answered. So Carpet Gym, first key factor that, that we just brought up. Zafir, I was just down in Argentina. Thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, hand cleaning is good to improve your power clean. Now, let me get back to this question. When I'm looking at how can I improve my size, if I've got a real tall dude, okay, I've got a tall athlete, the first thing is how much protein are you taking in? So 6'4", let's say you want to weigh 300 pounds. If you want to weigh 300 pounds, you better be eating 270 to 300 grams of protein a day. Okay, 270 to 300 grams of protein a day. This is for Carpet Gym. The next thing, four grams of carbs per pound of body weight, minimum. Okay, so if we want to weigh 300 pounds, we should be getting 1,200 carbs a day. So yeah, that'd be that's a lot. Okay, that's gonna get our that's gonna get our calories. So let's say let's lower that. Let's say it's three grams. Let's say it's 3,600 calories. You want to weigh 300 pounds? You're gonna have to eat 3,600 calories just from carbs. And then you put in that protein, and then you're getting wow, that might be a little high now that I'm thinking about that. Let's do this. Let me let me backtrack on that one. I'm doing my math in my head, and if I went two grams of, of carbs per pound, that would be 600 carbs. So if I got 600 carbs times four, that'd be 2,400 calories from carbohydrates. So let's do that. 2,400 grams of carbohydrates, 2,400 calories from carbohydrates. Then I go the same thing. I'm trying to get 300 grams of protein. Um, so 300 grams of protein is going to get me 1,200, uh, wait, 4 times 3, 1,200. No, 4 times 3, yeah, so my math was actually off there. Yes, 4 times 3 is 1,200. So 1,200 calories from protein, 1,200 calories from uh, carbohydrates. So you get 2,400, is that right? Jesus Christ. Why is my math so bad this morning? Uh, 4 times 1,200. Oh, 4,800. Wow. I am doing a terrible job with my mathematics. So let's cut that. Um, 300 times 4, 1,200 calories. 300 times 4, 1,200. 2,400 cows plus probably another 80 to 100 cows from fat. So 80 to 100, that'd be 2,700. Yeah, that actually makes sense. I was really off with my math. My mental math was terrible. I apologize. Yeah, Matthew, Vincent, you did the math for me. I should have been paying attention. Uh, 3,600 without fat. You add in that fat, you're probably going to get close to 5,000 uh, calories. And if you want to weigh 300 pounds, that's a big factor. So Carpet Jim Ollie, holy freaking crap was my math bad. Matthew, Vincent, thank you for doing that. Jeez. I'm sad that my math was that bad. I'm usually good with mental math. Uh, Kevin, before we answer this, is asking, any plans on making a video on athlete testing on different sports at the start and end of offseason? Um, we can do that on peak strength if you want that. I could do that in June for peak strength. Okay, now, so carpet gym, that's the first big factor. You're going to eat 5,000 calories a day if you want to get to 300 pounds. The next thing. Heavier pulls, so snatch, snatch grip RDLs, snatch grip high pulls, uh, back squats, back squat to box, front squats. Increase your volume of full compound movements. That's how we're going to build a lot of mass. Okay, Timothy Davis, you got to eat more. Um, you're not eating enough. I know you're not eating enough, and you make excuses about not eating enough. So don't give that to me. I can see you in those chat in the chat. Uh, <laughs> so that's another big factor is that if you're adding volume. Uh, if you're adding volume with the big squats, with the big pulls, and you're eating 3,600 calories without fat, that's just from protein and carbs. Now you add in the fat, you get another 900 plus calories. Okay, now we're getting close to 500 uh, calories a day or 5,000 calories a day. That's going to help you. Um, so that would be my answer for Carpet Gym. Now, Real Pupper 2743. I'm still shook by how bad my morning math was. Yo, Dane, I'm in a weird situation, but hopefully you can help like you always do. I'm trying to increase my speed substantially. Okay, so this is a, a question that sort of goes along with the live stream theme. Uh, that live stream theme of how to program for speed. I'm in a weird question. Real pupper, 2743. But hopefully you can help me like you always do. I'm trying to increase my speed substantially, particularly for the 100 meters. Okay, I've diagnosed my weakness as absolute strength. So he's not strong enough. And I want to point this out. I was watching a guy who's like one of those hardcore functional dudes, um, always talks about all these different positions and I'm watching him 
7,000 calories. I do not believe that, Timothy. Uh, he's always talking about how lifting heavy is not that good. And then this dude's doing hurdle hops at like 30 inches and dying. I'm just like, dude, hurdle hops can help so much. Or squatting more can help so much more, so much with hurdle hops. Here we go. Real pupper. I know you made countless videos on speed and hypertrophy, but I'm also trying to gain muscle mass for this football season at the same time. So this guy, real pupper, wants to get bigger for football, and he wants to get faster for the 100 meters. I hope you could outline a full week of training. <laughs> Uh, five days a week, preferably. So me and many others who are in the same predicament can increase their speed and increase lean muscle mass at the same time so we can excel in multiple sports. Okay. So real pupper. Day one. We're going to go big O lift. Technical coordination, power clean. Okay. Day uh, 2A, I want pause back squats, five triples. Pause back squats with an auditory command to coming out of the bottom. Do that with contrast method, a box jump or something like that. Then we get into the accessories, uh, hamstring pulls, and maybe some sprinter glute hams. Day two, I want push press from the jerk box, okay? Push press. And then we can do explosive push-ups with a whole bunch of dynamic trunk control work. If you're trying to get bigger for football, we've got to do upper body work. So explosive push-ups, um, let's say pull-ups with a plate on your feet, to focus on that trunk control. Let's say you do some crazy banded uh, incline dumbbell bench. So banded incline dumbbell bench with some more, some some other variation of a pull up, maybe ring pull ups to help with trunk control even more. And then we can focus on some ab stuff at the end. Athlete day, okay, day three, athlete day. We wanna focus on 100 meter work. So seated hurdle hops after you do your PVC pipe walks, uh, seated hurdle hops, okay. If you watch these guys who run the best 40s or that are running the best 100 meters, watch their plant leg, their lead leg coming out of the box, okay? Watch their lead leg, okay? If you watch B. John Robinson come out of the blocks, um, DJ Ward coming out of his 40, his ankle is stable the entire time as he's driving. So we can then put in some reflexive movements into that athlete day where we're holding that plantar flexion. Okay, so plantar flex, skater squat to box. Another great one that you can pair with the seated box jumps or a seated, uh, seated jumps into hurdle hops. You can do single leg bounds uh, over mini hurdles, okay? And then stair jumps. And then you can finish with uh, a sled pull, okay? Weighted sled pull, 35 pounds on there, do 10 reps, okay? Then we get into impulse day, single leg squat always. But we're gonna start that with a two box power clean or a two box power snatch. Okay, or high hang power snatch. And then you can get into the single leg squats, pair that with, let's say, jump lunges. Okay, after the jump lunges paired with the single leg squats, now we can get into sliding caustic squats uh, and uh, dumbbell drop RDLs to snatch to box. Right there's day four, day five, big time hypertrophy day. Dude, these are all examples for real pupper. You guys can get these examples inside of the app Peak Strength. Just head over to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store, and you can get that real pupper for five free days. You can get that for five free days of training. Start your journey to attain that peak strength. But looking at plantar flexion is key. How do you hold that ankle stable? How do you work through the reflexive movement? How do you use the strength properly? And that's where the reflexive movements with the absolute strength movements, that's all paired together. So I just laid out that five day program for real pupper. So that's the big thing that we're trying to do here now, guys, is that we're gonna do the t-shirt giveaway in every single YouTube video when you comment, when you've got all your notifications on and you follow the channel. Then on top of that, at the YouTube Live, we're gonna take three sweet comments off of our videos and we're gonna answer those three sweet comments every single week. Now, I'm getting into the comment section. Muhammad Hassan, what if I'm already 270, I wanna get down to 200 but keep my strength? It's going to be very challenging. Um, the first thing, though, start with a two to three hundred caloric deficit, and then slowly drop that uh, drop that weight off. Make sure you're squatting frequently. Make sure you're sleeping well. When you're in a caloric deficit, you need to be getting enough sleep. Uh, that's going to be some of the major factors that go into this. John, if you got peak strength, uh, how would you program for for long drive? I would program very similar to the way that we program for power sports. Okay, so. Um, you could go into the app. I would say get like a D Lyman program, honestly, and that's how I would program for for uh, for.
for long drive. And there actually might even be long drive in there. Um, Justin DB is asking, when do you use straight set versus ramping for the weight? So I like to use straight sets across, especially for weightlifting movements when we're trying to ingrain technique. Okay, can that, can that become repeatable? And then once that becomes repeatable, then the next week we might do waves. Okay, so we might do changes to challenge the way the athlete thinks about their, their technique. So if you can execute straight sets and, and, uh, and display that technical execu execution, can we, can we do waves like 3 2 one, three, two, one, three, two, one, and you can change the load on the bar and still display that, that great technique? That's the, that's the major factor. Um, so Steve Wonderlin is asking if the next summit that we're going to be doing, and our next summit is going to be June, I think it's June 2nd and 3rd, if I remember correctly. Um, we had a little plug in yesterday's video for this. If you guys, uh, if you guys head over to GarageStrength.com, you could sign up for the for the June uh, Coaches Summit, and we're gonna cover a whole bunch of stuff like group training, how to test your athletes, um, how to deal with different training groups at the same time, um, how to make sure everybody's making progress. So Steve's asking, uh, is that gonna be available for purchase? It will be available for purchase, but it's gonna be available for purchase probably like a year after. Uh, probably within like a year, Steve. Um, maybe we'll do like a YouTube live there just to make it a little spicy. Now, Uto S17. I haven't hit my PR for the snatch for a month. How can I get better at snatch? More volume. Where's that technical error? You know, is it off the floor? Are your knees staying back too long? Are your knees staying forward too long? Um, are we looking at problems with the finish from the hip into the catch? Do you have confidence in getting down into the hole in the catch? Um, is, it, is it issues overhead? Do you need to do snatch balances? Do you need to do low hang, no feet snatch? And do you need to squat more? And I think when you, when you look at it, I haven't PR'd in a month. Guys, keep this in mind, okay? Alex Rose, who's a garage strength thrower, He's the number one discus thrower in the world currently. He threw 70 meters. He is the 24th furthest throw in the history of the world. He's the number one guy in the world. He started training with us in 2015. Eight years of training. Think about that commitment to time. That comprehension of time. And I think that one of the biggest differences, yes, uh, for, the, for the channel members, Steve, I think that one of the biggest differences with world-class athletes is they value time over a much larger spectrum, okay? So they see time for what it is. And when you're a novice athlete or a younger athlete, you don't have perception of time yet because you're less mature. That's okay. But you'll say, I haven't PR'd in a month. And then you start, you start to panic. You get frustrated. You get mad. But if you look at what time is and you value the effort that you're putting in consistently you might not PR every single month. You might PR three times in one month, and then you might go six months where you don't PR at all. And I think keep that in mind as an athlete while you're making that progress because it's not this perfect linear pathway, okay? And even if you guys, you know, inside inside a GarageTrank program design, available at GarageTrank.com, when, when you guys look at how we lay it out, it's sort of like this cycle, okay? It's like high volume, low volume, high volume, low volume. And it, you've got to figure out when you're feeling the best, when you're not feeling the best, how you can optimize your technique, how you can optimize your strength. And you're dealing with these things back and forth to just slowly plod away and make these gains. But it always comes back to that long-term commitment is key. If you just keep grinding, the PRs are going to come. But you can't, you can't expect it that it should happen all the time. Okay, so that, that's my answer for you, Toe. Um, I want to go back over this, this bulking thing. I, I'm really mad at myself for my poor math, so I wanted to do a little example of if I weigh 250 pounds, if, let's say I want to get to 250 pounds, I should be eating um, I should be eating 250 grams of protein a day. So 250 grams would give me of protein a day, so that's four uh, calories per gram. So that's going to give me a thousand calories just from protein. That's going to, and if I eat four grams of carbs per pound of body weight, that's going to give me a thousand cows 
from carbohydrates. And then let's say I have 100. Yeah, so I would have 2,900 calories to try to get to 250 pounds. 2,900 calories to get to 250 pounds. I just wanted to clarify my mental math there. I was still a little shook from my poor mental math on that 300-pound that question from Carpet Gym Oli Lifting. All right, let's get into some more of these. My hips are always cracking and sometimes in pain when I do kicks. I'm very inflexible. Trey, my question would be, are you doing kicks for striking? Are you doing kicks for um, kicking out football, for playing soccer? Uh, does it happen at full speed? Do you warm them up properly? Can you do a Copenhagen plank? Can you do side band walks? Can you do um, you know split squats to warm up? Try to make sure that you're doing all those things properly before you, you get into that competitive state so that everything is greased and you're lubed up, ready to roll. Um, Timo, Timo, I want to train my acceleration technique for sprinting. I got to lower that. I want to train my acceleration technique for sprinting. Any advice how often to train and what exercises to do? Acceleration technique for sprinting, I would you know focus on uh, hill sprints and sled pulls, 20-meter uh, sled pulls. Uh, 10, 10 sets of one pull, rest three minutes with a 35-pound plate on or a 25-pound plate. Um, I would focus on single leg squats. I would focus on my favorite is the, the planner, planner flexed uh, skater squat switches, R2. If I only have two lower body days per week, can I train the plyometric day with technical coordina coordination movements and with absolute strength movement and rest are plyometric or is it too much? So R2 is if I only have two lower body days per week, you're asking, can I do, so you would do a technical coordination movement, so let's say a power snatch before plyometrics, and then, and with absolute strength movements. Okay, so you want to do almost like contrast methods. So you, let's say you do a, a power snatch on day one. Uh, 1A would be a power snatch. 2A would be a contrast method of a front squat with hurdle hops. 3A would be more plyometrics. I think that's fair. And then on day two, you would do all plyometrics. Is that what you're asking, R2? If so, I think that's okay. But there's going to be a point where you're going to need to focus more on, on strength, uh, building more strength. JWS, hey coach, I'm an elite javelin thrower from the UK. Is there any way I can join your program and train with your athletes in the States? 6'7", 255. JW5, not JWS. JW5, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I could help to a point with your technique, but I would want to help more so with, I would want to help more so with your, your strength movements and your strength patterns and your speed. Um, you, so you're asking to come here to the U S to train at garage strength. You would still have to pay the onsite fee to train with us. Uh, you'd lift with the group, um, and we'd get you to throw at the local university or at the local high school. Uh, but it is possible you can DM me or you can email support at garage strength.com or throws university at gmail.com. It is possible. Um, I would recommend fish oil for sure for clicking joints. Um, that is possible. So going back to Trey's question uh, with Trey, I got a splinter in my freaking pinky last night. I got stabbed. I was cutting grass. I got stabbed by prickers here. And then I got a splinter in my freaking pinky. It's driving me nuts. But yeah, for Trey's question even, it's like fish oil can help. Proper warm-ups can help. Uh, slow buildup. Dynamic stretching can help with the clicking stuff. Making sure that you're doing PVC pipe walks, all that stuff's great. Um Let's see, Steve, can high school kids lift in the morning and the evening if they're not in a sport, but how would you program that? I would say that's a good question because you don't want to burn out high school kids. You don't want to burn them out, but at the same time, some high school kids have tons of energy, and if they're getting decent sleep, honestly, I think, I think that's perfectly fine. When I have kids train twice a day, did you start off with linear periodization at garage strength? I'll, I'll answer that. Hold on. I would say start off with like back squats or a bench press, something like that. So like an absolute strength movement in the morning is usually better if it's before school. You know, let's say they come in 730, you do an absolute strength movement and then you do an, a hypertrophy exercise. Then post school, you could do your technical coordination movement and then you could do some of your accessories or plyometrics. But typically in the morning, I even with my weightlifters, I almost always will do absolute strength movements first just to just to wake up and feel everything. Um, 
and, and that's that's where you're going to see a little bit better benefit. And I also think there's some potentiation. This might sound voodoo, but if you're waking up, let's say you wake up at 7, you get some sunlight, and then you go train at like 8 o'clock. It establishes that circadian rhythm. And if you look at like 2.30 is when you might train, uh, you would go 7.30 to 10.30. So it goes in three-hour cycles, 10.30 um, to one thirty, So around one thirty or two, ideally you would be able to train that second time. And that's going to be on that next wave, uh, for your circadian rhythm. So they should feel pretty good then. Uh, I, I, I think that's possible. So Kevin is asking that when we started GS, did I start with linear periodization? So linear periodization would just be like, think about this real simply, like you do sets of 10 for four weeks, then you do sets of eight for three weeks then you do sets of six for three to five weeks and then you do sets of three okay that's like a real basic way to look at linear periodization so for kevin i would say when we're looking at like when i first started back in the day i would say yes like this is i'm just trying to think and how i can explain this back in like 1998 to 2000 yes Okay, when I was growing up, I would still do crazy drop sets, though. I would still do a lot of just wacky stuff that my high school coach would have me do. Okay, come to your house at 3.30, Steve. Yeah, that's fine. That's perfectly fine to do that. So to answer Kevin's question, now when I started Garage Strength, you have to keep in mind this time frame. I came home in 2007, 2008, or 2008, I came home from uh, training with Dr. B., so I did a, a version of linear periodization when I was in college, but then Dr. B uses what's called the complex method, okay? Complex method. And Dr. B's method is sort of crazy where you essentially do the same lift. Let's say if you train six days a week, you could do two options. You might, and we would train six days a week, twice a day, okay? So we go like three days on, one off, three days on, one off. But you would train in the morning and at night. And you would do two options. You would either do the same lift every session or you would do a lift in the morning and a lift in the afternoon. And then you would repeat the same lift in the morning and you would repeat the same lift in the afternoon. So you're either doing one workout, the same thing all the time, or you were doing two workouts, the same thing all the time. And then your adaptation would be studied based off of, you know, how you're responding to the, to that, that implement in training for throwing and the, ab the, the adaptation would then be based off of how far you were throwing or how short you were throwing and how your, your body's feeling was. Uh, and that would change, you know, you could, uh, he might give you a new program after three weeks or after 10 weeks. It, de it depended. So that's sort of like a brief way of the complex method. Now there was also periods of the year that would be focused on general prep that there would be general prep exercises. There would be specific preparation exercises. So specific preparation exercises might be like if for a shot putter throwing a cinder block. So as you go through that, you know, I came home and I wanted to implement the complex method, but I also was trained um, in linear periodization. I also, at this time then, had a phone call from the Olympic champion, Adam Nelson, uh, who wanted me to work with him. And... He said, Dane, you know, I want to learn what you did uh, with Dr. B. So I, I learned from Dr. from Dr. B, and then I started to work with Adam Nelson. And then Adam Nelson was the one who was like, hey, Dane, you should go learn from Charles Poliquin. And so when I went and learned from Poliquin's group, that's when I really started to learn about uh, Dietmar Schmidt-Bleicher's um, undulating periodization model. And so I sort of took, you know, so I learned a lot from the Poliquin group about undulating periodization, really from studying uh, Dietmar schmidt -Bleicher. Um I'm writing down some notes here. And then, and then I, when I came home, I realized, look, if I'm going to train people, there's a couple factors. I don't know everything that Dr. B knows about his system. And then two, his system's really boring and just really like horrible to do. It's really, really hard. And if I want to get a high school kid to come and train with me and I want to make money off of it, it's really hard to convince a wrestler to do the same workout all the time. So then I started to take the principles that helped me when I was in high school. I started to take the principles that helped um, everything uh, that I learned from Poliquin and everything that I used when I talked with Adam Nelson 
And the stuff that I learned from Dr. B, and I sort of molded that into our own system. And so that's how that system came to be. And I hope that helps Kevin uh, understand sort of how everything came to be. So I think there's like some really good things you can pull from linear periodization. There's a lot of research. And, and Jason, if you're inside the research document, um, there's a there's I think there's a document in there of, of recently published study that sort of training all of the characteristics of strength training. So like training blast impulse, training uh, absolute strength, training strength endurance, all at the same time is more effective than just focusing on one over the other. And I think that's a downfall of linear periodization. Um, and even when I was doing linear periodization, we were still doing all strength characteristics at the same time. Uh, so that's sort of the, the, the way that we came up with and developed parabolic periodization was sort of like this this molding of like what my dad taught me when we first started to lift, um, what what I learned in college from our, my my collegiate coaches, um, and then what I learned from Doctor B, and then what I learned from Paula Quinn, and then and then most importantly what I learned from my athletes here, uh, and how the athletes adapted, and how we continued to hold people accountable, and how we got them into the gym, and and in all reality, if you get people in the gym more frequently they're going to get better long term. And so that's a key part of periodization that we're missing out on is like people will be all worried about these charts and these graphs and all this stuff. And hey, this is what science says about velocity based training. And it's like, yo, just tr keep training. If we can keep training, if we can keep people in the sport longer, they're going to get better. And that's more important than the data. Sorry, but it is, you know, it's like looking at Bob Beeman's jump. If you, you know, like Bob Beeman jumped 29.5. Okay, 890, the second greatest jump of all time. But he got to that point because he was jumping for 15, 20 years. So it takes time to develop to that point. And I think that that's something that we forget. Um, and he didn't have a periodization system when he did it. So I think that that's all important stuff. Um, yeah, I think, Kevin, I think that's the biggest lesson too. What you just pointed out there is it's interesting how environments impact us and, and until we look back and it's like being aware of that time and being aware of what you can learn during those time frames is most important. And if we're able to challenge and question what we're learning and, you know, one of the best things I think, you know, looking back now was like my dad, when we would go to the grocery store here is called Redner's. Okay. So, and there, Jason just put in the, the, the journal I was just talking about. So that, that paper was just published this year. So what's interesting is that paper is is not solidifying, but pretty close um, proving out some of the stuff that we learned through intuition. Some of the stuff that probably Bob Beeman was training with in the 60s off of intuition. Okay. Um, but one of the biggest factors going back to this, Kevin, was like, you know, my my dad would, we would go to the grocery store and the, the grocery store here is called Redner's, like I mentioned, and, and they used to have this whole aisle of magazines. And in the aisle of magazines, there'd be like muscle fitness um, flex, all like the old school stuff. And every once in a while he'd let us buy a magazine. Okay. But what was cool was you learned early that there's a lot of different ways to get stronger. There's a lot of different ways to improve. And it's important to have the open mind to keep learning. And that was the biggest thing from Dr. B. When I would interview Dr. B at his house and pick his brain about how he was training us, he would scream at me like, Dane, there's so many different ways to do this, but you have to have a system. And when you can des design a system off of what you have available to your setup or to everybody, all the athletes set up, that's going to be the system that you're going to thrive in. And I think that's the one thing that we're trying to do for you guys with parabolic periodization. And parabolic periodization is the spine. It's the backbone of peak strength. So the, the peak strength backbone is developed off of what we did in my garage you know, in the 90s and the 2000s and what we're doing here right now. And I think that that's a really important thing to, to recognize too and how, how dynamic the system is and how successful the system is as well because of how we learn from the athletes. Um, ooh, which kind of athletes do you love to train the most? The athletes I love to train the most are the ones that implement the, the system of training, the, the program to a T, the ones that just execute. They ask minimal amount of questions they know the goal of the programming and they follow the recovery as well as they possibly can. And they just keep doing it. They just keep executing and executing. And then they provide feedback when it's needed. Those are my favorite athletes. 
Okay, so R2 is clarifying. Well, wait, let's go MR guy. How do I build quality muscle and get shredded? I'm 59K and I want to get to 60K. I'm a high school wrestler. You got to build, you know, you got to get in that caloric surplus that we talked about earlier. I would have um, 140 grams of protein every single day. I'd have 140 to 200 grams of carbohydrates every single day. I'd make sure that you're benching twice a week. You're squatting twice a week. You're doing power cleans twice a week. You're doing 100 pull-ups three days a week. Then you're going to get swole. R2 is clarifying. His first lower body day is full power from Rebellion. Okay, so he's on the Rebellion off-season program, which is an offshoot. Um, and I meant that, can I add technical movements and absolute strength movements to the Rebellion's? Oh, yes. I wouldn't necessarily add a absolute strength day to that, but I would add a technical coordination day. So you could put in like a power clean or a high hang power clean or a high hang snatch, and I and that would be fine. R2, I would say you should try out the Peak Strength app and let me know what you think about that based off of what you've done in the past. You get those five free days of training, try it out, put in there for a running back. Um, let me know what you think. You get those five free days of training. Um, Bushy, you're saying he's asking what sport. I don't I don't necessarily know if I can answer that because it's like it all depends on the athlete type and the athlete ability, the athlete ability to deal with stress. Um, I think that's one thing I'm struggling with is like, and maybe this is like a therapy session for me as a coach, is that I have athletes that will be, I want to talk to you, I want to meet with you, can we discuss all these things? And then we discuss these things, and then they want to change the program when they're halfway through the program and they don't want to do certain lifts the way I want them to do the lifts. And then they're, then they're hurt and, and then they, they miss all these things and they, they miss training sessions and they rearrange all these things. It's like, dude, do you want me to write the program? Or you want to write the program. If I write the freaking program, execute it the way I write it and do that for eight years, do that and just do it. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm, I, I feel like I'm sounding old. Should rock climbers train legs? Yes. So in June, we're coming out with a strength training for rock climbing. And this video is going to blow rock climbers' minds. I think rock climbers need to, other than weightlifting, wrestling, wrestling, I think rock climbers need to do a lot of very, very precise leg plyometric work and a lot of precise uh, isometric and unilateral work with their legs. Very, very precise. People forget that your climbing and your stability and your your foundation is from your legs. Like, they're not climbing. You know, a lot of people might think like rock climbers are just climbing with their upper body and their legs are hanging there. They're using their legs to drive those 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 movements and those uh, those different positions of their hand. And if their legs are strong enough to cover on an explosive movement, you know, an, an explosive technical movement, let's say, from one side to another, they've got to be able to jump somewhere and they've got to get into position to change their hands. And so if their leg strength's not there or their explosive strength's not there or their isometric strength isn't there in their feet or in their quads, they're screwed with their upper body. So the stronger and more explosive their legs can get, the better positioning they're going to be in with their hand placement. So when we're looking at rock climbers, we also need to think like, they don't need to gain weight, okay? They just need, they don't need this crazy absolute strength. They need relative strength. They need to be extremely strong pound for pound. So they've got to be dialed in with their nutrition, but they've also got to be dialed in with something like uh, power cleans, power snatches, two box snatches, and then singles to, to triples on squats and a lot of plyometric movements. And that's going to help rock climbers quite a bit um, because there's such, there's such precision in their, in their patterns, and there's such precision, and if you can get stronger and more explosive, you are able to take better risks because you know you can handle these different patterns. Okay, so if we can train them in the weight room, but we also don't want to, we, we don't, that's, and this is for Hollis. This question was asked by Hollis. We don't want to take away from uh, their technique on the wall or their technique out, out in, in their climbing ability. So we just got to think through that. What's your favorite abductor and adductor muscle exercises for athletes? Um, adductor, like a, a hip lock, let's say like a hip lock, um, Copenhagen plank that's that's got some type of upper body movement, and then, or a Cossack squat that's banded. Um, abductor, 
Dude, side band walks is great. Um, I really like side jumps, side side jumps with like a, a kettlebell, something like that. I think that's a great exercise for abductor power. Um, so Kevin is saying the biggest counter argument to bench press being overrated, saying there's other ways to develop, other ways to help with shoulder health and bench has no carryover. Carry over die to base of support. So a lot of people are saying bench press is overrated. I mean, here's my thing, Kevin. It's so well loaded. It loads so well. Um, you have to recruit crazy, especially if you look at like a dumbbell bench, you get great range of motion through your shoulders, your triceps, your pecs. Um, I, I just don't think it's overrated, you know, and the load on a barbell bench press is so heavy. You're in the range of motions. Great. It's really, really good. Um, and it's going to help with your military press. It's going to help with your shoulders. It's going to help with your handstand pushups. Uh, obviously you've got to do all these things. I, I don't think it's, I, I think one thing we get stuck in, in the strength world is we look at everything as an absolute, like if you just bench press, it's overrated. And it's like, yeah, but what if I bench press and I do dips and I do military press, and I do handstand pushups and I do clap pushups, I do explosive pushups, I do X pushups, I do gorilla pushups, I do behind the neck jerks. Why are we looking at it through an absolute lens? Like when we're doing sports performance, nothing's absolute. We've got to train all of these joint angles, all these speeds, all of these isometrics, all these endurance based positions. So it's like, I don't think it's healthy or proper to look through it in that regard. So Robert Paul is saying reflexive strength, sports specific for round net players. Dude, I don't know what round net is. Is round net like uh, that the basketball game that women play in the Commonwealth where there's no backboard? Is that what round net is? I don't know what round net players, I don't know what round net is. I'd have to watch that. Um, how should I train differently because I'm a quarterback? Jack Savage, dude, I think quarterbacks should train like tennis players. I think they should do a lot of agility work a lot of freaking strength work in their hips, a lot of freaking strength work in their trunk, uh, and a lot of shoulder stability and a lot of lat training. So you could almost look at yourself like a swimmer with your lats, uh, a, a tennis player with that overhand position, a tennis player with your agility and the speed. Like, why aren't we looking at tennis players at how fast they are and training our QBs that way? And I, and I know quarterbacks now are a lot different than like our Tom Brady model. So QBs are a lot faster. Um, but that's how I would look at that. Um, Oh, round that spike ball? Oh, heck yeah, dude. Spike ball's legit. So if I'm looking at spike ball, again, this would be really, this is just the realm of chaos coordination uh, and the realm of trunk control. And I think that the more, the more you can focus on stable uh, trunk positions and you think through stable trunk positions, the better, the better you're going to be able to attack the ball and, and control the ball with spike ball. Um, I would train you probably like a wrestler or a tennis player, like I mentioned, because you want to be so explosive and it's going to be a little bit more of relative strength. Uh, Gary's asking, coach, I've been doing bodybuilding workouts for six years consistently and have developed a significant amount of strength, strength. I want to take it to a higher level. How should I start? So Gary, are you asking, you want to be like a professional bodybuilder or do you want to be like a strong man, a power lifter, a weight lifter? Where do you want to go? Do you want to stay in the bodybuilding realm because you spent six years doing this? Uh, answer that question for me and I can answer you further, Gary. Emil, I'm about to go to the gym. I don't know what to do. What do you think for the 100 and the 200 meters? I would go back to the beginning of this video where I laid out a five-day program for 100 meters. There's a five-day program in there uh, that I put together real quickly um, just off the top of my head. Or if I was Emil, I would download the Peak Strength app I'd go in and what I want to say I want to focus on sprints, okay? I want to focus on the sprints. I can't use my phone as an example to show you the Peak Strength app. I just thought of that because it's live streaming. Sadly, I can't do that. But I could show you how to select the, the sport in Peak Strength, and then you could actually use that to dial in your speed work. Uh, Alex is asking, could you make a video about the mentality or mental toughness and focus becoming a beast in the weight room where a high-performing high athlete requires? We could do that. We could do that. I mean, I would say this, Alex. We did that seven things every elite athlete does. I would start with that video. Um, I would start with the seven things that every elite athlete does. That video just came out like three weeks ago. 
and then we can talk about mental toughness. But I think mental toughness is such a long, first of all, it's an abstract term. And, and I would try to define what is mental toughness. Mental, de- t- mental toughness is being able to handle long-term stress. It's being able to do what you're asked to do by your coach with minimal challenging, minimal challenging, just doing what the heck you're asked to do. That's mental toughness. Implementing that over a very, very long time frame, optimizing your recovery and performing everything on a daily basis around your main goal. Okay. That's really hard. Um, Robert Paul is asking if there's any discounts for peak strength for students. Your work has a price and this price is legit, but for students, it's a really high in price. Hey, don't forget Basically, it's 40 bucks a month, so you would get five workouts every week. I think we figured out, what is that, $1.50 or 2 bucks a workout? Um, but Robert, I don't know if I should tell you this, but you could email support at garagestrength.com. Maybe we give that student discount. I don't know if we have one or not. Uh, Trevor's behind me. He might be rolling his eyes getting mad at me. Uh, Coach, I do this for personal enjoyment. So this is Gary. So Gary, if you really enjoy you know, just for your personal training, uh, your bodybuilding career, you want to get a little bit more intense. Can you add a day of training? Do you train six days a week? Um, I would say that Tyler Williams is coming in. This is the man with the master plan. The man who is focused through mental toughness. He is the definition of mental toughness. So if you're in the chat right now, Tyler Williams is in there. He's like number six in the U S right now in the hammer throw. And he just asked this question. Super general throws, lift, split for high school throwers. Mostly beginner level, throwing, lifting days per week. Total time in the weight room versus throwing. So he's asking, if you've got a beginner thrower and they want to get strong, they still want to throw, I would say four days a week. They do a leg lift, but they would throw for 25 throws, then they do that leg lift. Okay, let's say that's on Monday. Tuesday, they throw and they don't do anything else. Wednesday, they, they don't throw and they do their upper body lift. Thursday, they throw and they do an impulse day. So like an impulse day would be a full body lift that's lighter, faster, and it takes 45 minutes. Friday, they throw and they do buys and tries for fun or they do a hypertrophy lift for their upper body. That would be my answer to that. Try to get, you know, 180 throws in a week. Try to lift four days a week. If you can do that, you're going to be an elite level thrower if you do that for five years. Five years. Five years. John Hirschman, have you done any research on supplementing with peptides? I have not. Um, I've I've heard about peptides, but I've never done any research on it because I know that shit's illegal. Um, as far as USADA is concerned, I don't know shit about it other than seeing it in you know my Google feed. Um, I watched... Yeah, I watched it. That's what gave me the idea uh, to go deeper. It's a difficult topic to dissect. Okay, so, and this is a question somebody asked about, um, somebody asked about this with um, David Goggins. And I think that, like, the hardest thing I struggle with with mental training is, one, having a, I, I actually think you as an individual have to lay out, like, what's your priority in life? What's your priority for your day to day? Like, um, how am I going to, yeah, Jason's doing a phenomenal job there. How am I going to go through my day to day life and execute what I want to execute with minimal distractions, um, and get on and make sure we're doing that properly. I think that's something that is really, really hard to do. Um, because oftentimes I think we get so distracted. I was thinking about this yesterday when I was programming. I noticed myself like three times picking up my phone and just looking at Instagram. And I'm like, dude, come on. You want to write this freaking program and help this dude uh, get better? Or you want to just be distracted? And I think prioritizing those things and holding yourself accountable and revisiting like how well you're doing that is important. I think that's a big factor behind mental toughness. And it's not mental toughness. It's just being zeroed in on your goal or being zeroed in on, on your pathway. And I think that that's... And it's just constantly trying to refine that and make yourself a better person. I think that's what mental toughness is. It's not even being mentally tough. It's in Confucianism, they call it uh, being a superior man, uh, being a, a superior human. And that comes back to 
basically like six principles. And I don't think that those six principles differ. I think that everybody has those six principles. And if you can look at those six principles consistently and hold yourself accountable, then you're going to be better. Lifting is so much fun. Um, lifting is so much fun because you see a result that's direct feedback. Okay. And so if I'm lifting and I'm squatting, I'm like, wow, my heart rate is skyrocketing. This is really hard. This is challenging. It's dis it's discomfort. Um, you don't feel good, but then when you're done, you feel really good. So you have this good feedback one immediately from lifting weights. Um, physically you could get a pump, let's say. And by the way, uh, they're seeing now that there is actually feedback that getting a pump one leads to big time gains, but two, it also helps with your recovery. So when, when, what makes lifting so enjoyable is the direct feedback in the acute setting. Okay. So there's the, the direct feed, feedback in the acute setting, but then also chronically, if you're lifting consistently, you see growth over a long period of time. You get stronger with curls. You get stronger with squats. You get stronger with benching. You get more explosive. You can jump more. Then you start to gain more muscle mass. You start to feel a little bit leaner. You're starting to prioritize your recovery. So what makes lifting fun is it's an easy method to dial in your habits. And when you dial in your habits, you start to value your time. And when you start to value your time, you start to in, enjoy your time more and you start to be more present. And that's, it's just this crazy feedback that's so direct. Um, Hollis is asking if it's possible to safely learn the Olympic lifts without a coach. 100% it's possible. One, I would argue, we've got a lot of videos on YouTube that could help you do that. And actually, Vasu, who was in this chat earlier, um, sent me a, a video on Instagram of his son using the technique stick with our mobility band, doing snatch presses, and even I think there were some overhead squats. So you can do it if you if you use the resources effectively. And it comes back to, you know, what are your resources? How frequently are you going to practice these things? How frequently, if you have a struggle in life or a struggle with your training, do you take a step back and, and not judge yourself, but look at it through the lens of like, I need to be better with X, Y, or Z. Um, Andrew is asking, have a little early arm bend in the snatch starts to bend around mid thigh. So when people have early arm bend, it's typically uh, weak upper back and weak hamstring. Should I put a lot of focus into fixing this? What is it that might be causing the early arm bend? Um, yeah, soreness is also a great feedback. Uh, tool for weightlifting. Andrew, I would say push through the heels more, push through the heels more to get a little bit more knee flexion. Um, and that's going to help load the hamstrings more as well and get that co-contraction in the quads and the hamstrings. And that should help with that, with um, getting rid of that arm bend. You know, low hang snatches help quite a bit. Ashley is asking, what are my top five exercises for increasing speed? Okay, so if I would look at top five, let's give you two specifics. Let's say um, hill sprints and sled sled pulls, okay, 20 yard sled pulls. So those are two specifics to sprinting. Let's give you a starting position, a two box power snatch. Okay, two box power snatch, I want that chest forward over the bar on the pull. Uh, let's go to a strength movement, a single leg squat. And if you guys, we did a whole video, Legend and I did a whole video on peak strength channel around getting faster. That's freaking awesome because it breaks down technique. And then we talk about lifts in each technical position. And then finally, uh, after the single leg squats, I'd say hamstring pulls, Nordic hamstring pulls. We want our semi-tendinosis, semi-membranosis to be as close to as strong as our biceps femoris. And when that happens, our hamstrings are going to be stronger and that's going to lead to more power output from the hammies. Hamstrings are fast twitch. So it's basically looking at like, what's the specific tool that we're going to use? What's the general prep tool? What's the tool or the lift per position? Those are all key. How would you start a career in sports training and development? I think one of the biggest things is like results. Um, I think taking things seriously. Here's a good example. Alex Rose hit me up in fall of 2015. Um, I had had a couple state medalists, state champions, um, but I, you know, we were a small gym. I think there was one or two clients or one or two, not one or two clients, one or two people working here with me and maybe one other person working. Um, and Alex was like, yo, I need a coach post collegiately. And I told him I would coach him for free. And it's like, dude, I'll do anything. 
I will do anything for athletes who are willing to train really, really hard. Um, and, and when you can do that, you can show your success. And when you can show your success, you start to build a reputation. When you build a reputation, word of mouth is powerful and people want to come train with you and they'll pay then. Uh, and then you can just get better and better and you just got to keep that cycle moving. But there's a lot of stuff you got to do. You got to work 70 plus hours a week. It's not forgive. It's unforgiving. Uh, as a profession early on and, and you know that was 2015 that was eight years ago now he's the number one discus throw in the world right now so I think it's it's keeping that stuff in perspective and and also recognizing like dude that I mean up until 2021 we weren't making a lot of money we weren't really making we weren't successful as a business we were just able to pay our bills like that's that's like some big things that you got to remember MR guy, I gave you that. You got to eat 2,900 calories. I already told you that. Come on, dog. Any books and courses. Garage Strength Program Design book and course. We go over all that stuff. Ville, Ville Tikanen. You've got to be finished, right? I'm, please tell me I'm right. How to combine weightlifting, learning calisthenic movements, and basic tricking. Ooh, that's good. Great question. And he plays futsal as well. One of the coolest. I think futsal's. I know people are going to say blasphemy. Um, I believe futsal is more entertaining to watch than soccer or football. It's like basketball with soccer. It's so freaking crazy. It's like handball, soccer, and basketball all mixed into a crazy sport. When I was down in Columbia, I spent like an hour and a half watching futsal tournaments in the streets of Columbia. It was so freaking cool. Um, so what I would do is... Uh, you could do like power snatch overhead squats. You know, you learn, you learn like weightlifting movements through complex or complexes. Make sure you learn them well. They're easy. And then you start doing things like, all right, I want to learn a pistol squat or I want to learn skater squats. And then you start doing some plyometric movements and it makes it fun. Um, yeah. Uh, MR guy, let's do this again. 250, or you want to get to 60 kilos, okay? You want to get 60K. Let's let's say you got to have 140 uh, grams of protein. So what's 140 times 4? That's uh, 560. So you're going to get 560 cows from carbs, 560 cows. Um, so what we're looking at there is 1,120 calories from protein 1120 calories total from protein and carbohydrates and then you could probably get 80 to 100 grams uh, of calories from fats so you're looking at like right around 2000 cows but you should be getting 100 and 140 grams of protein a day minimum and 140 grams of carbs a day minimum i would say minimum okay so if you increase that then you would decrease your 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 protein or your fat consumption Ville Tikanen is saying, yes, I am finished. Thank you. I'm from Australia and I love soccer. Thanks for tuning in. Um, how do you like to program weighted pull-ups? I like to program weighted pull-ups as uh, 2A or 2B. Tyler Williams, you're crazy. Boom. Huge super chat. Tyler's part of the GS Throw Squad. Grateful to be part of the GS Squad. Best sports performance group you will find along with a support system. Just listen to that example of Alex Rose. Looking forward to seeing you guys in May and at USA's. 100%. I can't wait to get to USA's this year with Tyler. Uh, see how he performs. He's an absolute animal. Uh, we plugged his, his Instagram channel. If you guys want to go check him out, give him some follows. Um, and, and he's part of the, the Garage Strength crew, so that's cool. A garage Strength crew is undeniably tough. What are some good exercises to transfer absolute strength into force for sprinting? Uh, this is from Douglas Tran. Uh, absolute good exercises to ab. So if we get really strong with like a single leg squat or a step up, okay, the way you can transfer that is through a plyometric movement that's direct. So let's say a jump step up, uh, a single leg bound, okay, single leg bound over many hurdles, a chaos single leg jump, um, and then sprints with the sled. Those are great ways. What leg exercises do you like for bouldering? This is from Zach. I like unbroken single leg squat, pistol, zombie front squat, sled work. Those are really, really good. Um, I would say pistol leg jumps, single leg stair jumps. 
Uh, those are going to be also great. Single leg stair jumps and single leg bounds for bouldering are also phenomenal. I'm going to take three more comments. Uh, I want to recap. Adrian Cortez, 5304. Adrian Cortez, 5304. He won the t-shirt giveaway. So Adrian, if you uh, email support at garagestrength.com, send us a screenshot of your channel. You can black out the revenue in there. Um, make sure we know it's you, and then you give us your address, put in your size in American t-shirt sizes. We can mail that out to you uh, to give you that giveaway. We're doing a t-shirt giveaway in each and every YouTube channel uh, video, main channel video. So if you guys comment and you have all of your notifications on and you subscribe to the channel, comment, all notifications on, you subscribe to the channel, you become eligible for that t-shirt giveaway. Uh, and we're going to be doing that consistently. And then we're going to take three questions from YouTube videos. So if you comment, and we really, really like the questions. You know, this week we answered Real Puppers, uh, Carpet Gym, Oli Lifting, and Zach Hurwitz's. They had great questions. That's what we're going to be using to start off these public lives. Um, and Jessica just commented, where can we buy that swole shirt? You can also buy that swole shirt. Uh, Jessica at GarageStrength.com. Jason, if you can put that link in there. Ilya is also asking about that Swole t-shirt. It is available at GarageStrength.com, and there's two versions. Um, so we'll put that link in that group chat. It's available online, and it's a sweet t-shirt. So I'm going to take two more questions before I head out for the day. Um, we got throwing coming up. Big discus weekend for us this past weekend. Yaime threw 66 meters twice without any wind. It was crazy. Uh, CC qualified for the world championships. Josh Sirachin has the number three throw in the U S. Um, and then Alex Rose is the number one ranked discus thrower in the world. 70 meters, top 24 throw of all time. One of the strongest, most explosive athletes ever broke the Oceana area record. Would you consider making a video on strength and conditioning for Ninja warrior? It is growing as a sport. So Hollis, that's a great one. Ninja Warrior, I think so, yeah, because we want to do that. We want to do that video on climbing. I think we got to do one on Ninja Warrior too. I think you're right. We'll do it. I'll do that. We're gonna get it done, Hollis. We're gonna get it done because that Ninja Warrior one is crazy. There's so much endurance. There's so much technique. There's so much uh, explosiveness involved and in, in overall absolute strength. Um, absolutely. Also, I hope you guys watched yesterday's video where we talked about just crazy plyometric work that would, Hollis, that would transfer over the Ninja Warrior realm as well. And you guys, we love, I thank you so much uh, for coming in and commenting. Um, what's the best squats to do? It's a band syndrome, Lynn Hill. Um, what's the best squats to do for IT band syndrome? I would say work on your TFL work. I would do a lot of TFL work if I've got that IT band syndrome. Uh, I would roll out hard uh, ahead of time. A lot of people say, don't roll out your IT band, but I think that's bogus. Uh, a lot of TFL work, a lot of banded squats, a lot of single leg squats banded where you try and keep that left knee out or your right knee out over that, that front foot. Kevin is asking me, what other channels do I like or follow? <laughs> I, watch, I watch a lot of like, just ridiculous stuff. Uh, I watch a lot of, I mean, I, I don't watch a lot of like strength stuff, honestly. Um, I watch a, a Corporus is one of my favorite ones. Um, he does a lot of anatomy work. Uh, I think he's cool. I, I like, dude, I watch Mr. Beast and Arak. Um, I watch Pokey Rev. I watch a lot of Pokemon stuff. Uh, I watch a lot of philosophy stuff. Like there's a, there's a, this is a guy has got he's got like four thousand subs. It's called like One Day University. He has like some cool videos that I like to watch. If I'm on the lawnmower and I want to listen and learn about something, I like to learn about. I'm getting diehard into um, back into philosophy and Confucianism. I don't know how long that's gonna hold up. I've been listening to a lot of Peter Atia. I got his book Outlive, and I'm like deep into that book right now. So that I'm, I've been listening to a lot of his podcasts too, but mainly listen to his book to try and learn how his thought process is around health and longevity. Thank you, Ilias. Boom. So yeah, that's, that would be my answer. Um, question. Can we expect any more rugby programming? I know we're a small group. But there's not much material out there. Esteban, June, we're doing a whole new rugby program video in June. 
But also, you can go to Peak Strength. You can click on the rugby program to help you with your overall training. And, and, and I'll sign off with that. Don't forget, you get five free days of training out of Peak Strength. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get five free workouts. You can cancel it at any time. It's going to help you start that journey to attain peak strength. Because remember, freaks, if you guys want to become champions, you've always got to cultivate your power. Peace. Ilias says he loves me. Thank you, Ilias.